So welcome. Um, as, I, as Tony mentioned, I'm going to be talking about uh, our recent work uh, using deep learning for image restoration. Uh, this is an ongoing project, uh, so it's not, it's, I guess, never complete, uh, but we have enough to share. And, and we have recently, uh, a month ago, a month and a half ago, put all of, uh, of the findings we're, we're ready to, to share and discuss in, both on GitHub for code review and, and testing, as well as, as a, a preprint on, on BioArchive. So you can find uh, pretty much all that I'm going to show today uh, in those two resources. So the general or the initial premise is really that in light microscopy, as in other imaging modalities, there are um, limitations. And we often have to, as microscopists, and, and um, we have to, to deal between those limitations and reach a compromise. And sometimes that means uh, sacrificing spatial resolution, sometimes imaging depth, sometimes temporal resolution. Uh, and sometimes you have to compromise everything in order to have a balance. And that's what uh, every microscopist ha has to do in order to get good enough image uh, to then do quantitative or qualitative uh, analysis of that, of those, um, those results, those, yeah, those data points. But wouldn't it be great if we could somehow um, change the rules a little bit or stretch those rules? Uh, and that's in, in a way what, what uh, a lot of people have been doing for a couple of decades already with deconvolution, so point spread function deconvolution. But more recently, there are advances using deep learning and machine learning as well that help uh, uh, and further augment the options that, that are available. So these concepts of machine and deep learning uh, are not really new. They come from uh, the early uh, 1900s. So you know, Alan Turing in the mid 1900s, mid, mid, in 1943, uh, was already uh, talking about uh, the concept of trying to uh, teach the machine uh, to, to run different pieces of code uh, and, and learn from that data. Uh, Arthur Samuel came soon after that, and he was more thinking about the application of this. So these two gentlemen, uh, almost a century ago, were already uh, talking about, and and to some extent, uh, Arthur was already testing some of these concepts of teaching a machine how to learn from, from data. In more recent years, and I won't go into a lot of details here, in more recent years, uh, there's been a lot of development in the field of machine learning, specifically with convolutional neural networks. And these are um, a niche, and now pretty broad niche, but a niche a, of, um, uh, of algorithms that are particularly good at learning complex nonlinear relationships. And, uh, and Jeff Hinton, uh, together with Jan LeCun, uh, have uh, really revolutionized the, the field. Of course, they have been helped a lot by hardware development and the availability of labeled data. Uh, so those three components, so better technology in terms of algorithms, better GPUs, faster GPUs, cheaper GPUs, as well as the availability of a lot of data that is labeled have enabled really the latest uh, burst in, in the interest and in the applicability of, of machine learning, in this case, deep learning. Uh, for a variety of uh, approaches. Uh, Jan LeCun, uh, sorry, uh, Ian Goodfellow has come up with uh, a very interesting uh, kind of extension of convolutional neural networks. And that's by using two convolutional neural networks competing against each other. And, and this is um, this is often, or it's described as, as a generative adversarial network. These are even better, it seems, in terms of performance. There is a little bit of a catch in terms of uh, artifact generation, which uh, I won't go into today, but it is very interesting technology. Uh, in our field of medical or biomedical imaging, um, Olaf Ronenberg is perhaps the better known person. Uh, he created a UNET, uh, which allows end-to-end -end, uh, training and segmentation of images, and it has been used for a number of other applications, as we as we'll see, uh, as we I'm sure you've seen with the CARE paper and with other applications that most of the time uh, use a UNET. Over the years, a lot of 
different applications or showcases of AI have come about. And, and they are all interesting to some extent, but uh, initially at least they were pretty much just games. Um, and games are good to test uh, narrow AI, uh, but they're not particularly interesting from an applicability point of view uh, in the real world. However, that has started to change uh, and it still is narrow AI, but now we are able to use different types of AI, most of the time using convolutional neural networks to predict, for example, heart attacks, uh, or to uh, to quickly analyze images. And there's a number of companies that now have FDA approval for a variety of applications from heart disease, stroke, and bone disorders. And the list is growing quite quickly uh, since 2017. 2017 is the, the first year where when there were some FDA approved. In our field of light microscopy and, and microscopy generally, it has, the, int the interest has increased a lot as well. As you can see, it's kind of going up quite a lot. Uh, on the left hand side are just searches. Uh, this, uh, this is microscopy over here. Uh, this is uh, deep learning and this is with uh, um, machine learning up here. So those are, those are increasing quite a bit. Uh, microscopy is kind of flat and if we look specifically at microscopy and machine learning or deep learning then they are both increasing quite a lot. And These are publications not just searches. These are Google searches. These are publications. So what about specifically in, in this field of AI and microscopy? That's what the, the presentation is about. There's been quite a bit over the years. Uh, here are some examples, very early examples uh, and well-known examples. One for segmentation, one for painting or virtual staining. Uh, and I think Susan and Tio are going to talk about this a little bit later today. Uh, the CARE paper, which was one of the first ones, perhaps the first one to talk about uh, denoising using UNET uh, for, for light microscopy, a super resolution uh, approach here by the OSCAN lab and a segmentation approach, one of the earliest approaches from the Alisman lab that is fully deployed in the cloud. However, there are quite a lot of concerns about using deep learning for microscopy and I just listed here a few, hallucinations, quality, reproducibility, the fact that it is a black box and overfitting. We try to mitigate, each of the researchers in this field tries to mitigate this, so do we. Uh, and, and I will address that a little bit, and I know other speakers will address that too. So generally, uh, when we train a supervised uh, model, uh, that's typically what I will talk about now, is uh, it, it is trained in this way. Start with some target or ideal image, uh, a batch of those, a batch of input data. Uh, this is trained with Whatever model you want to use, we use 3D RCAN typically, but you can use a UNET like in the CARE paper or some, some other architecture. This creates you a model that is now has the right weights and balances and, and it is able to um, relate uh, the, the patterns on the target ideal image to the input image. And therefore, when you input a new image that has not been seen by the network, it can restore uh, or very similar restored to the quality of the, in, the the ground truth data. So feeding new input data will uh, will be it, it is possible to restore the the quality of the the, the image almost to the same quality as the ground truth. So that's the general principle. Uh, I will talk about three types of restoration: denoising, artifact removal, and super resolution. And uh, in blue, the ones. The items that are uh, highlighted in blue are the ones that are part of the 3D RCAN paper that you can uh, find in BioArchive. Just search for 3D RCAN in there and you will find it. Uh, first authors are uh, Hideki, Gigi, uh, and, uh, and uh, Hoyen. Uh, there's, I think, uh, and, uh, and there's one additional author. There's four first authors on that paper. And the last author is, is Harry Shirov. So both, all four, uh, sorry, all uh, all the items in blue are going to be described briefly in this presentation. Uh, the others are, are not yet uh, ready for, for presentation. So on the denoising, we have used the iSIM and did experiments with in 3D and 3D plus time. On the 3D side, we studied quite a lot of organelles uh, and then we applied models that were created in 3D over on the on the 3D plus time. Uh, dimension. Uh, so 
these models, the 3D plus time model, or the, the model, sorry, the models were created for 3D data sets, and then so fixed samples, and then we applied them on a 3D plus time sample. So we are restoring the quality of, uh, of life, uh, life cell imaging uh, by imaging at low quality and then restoring it to high quality. On the artifact removal, uh, the experiments that we did were with confocal with DISPIM as well. And I will actually show you some data from this branch here, the, the confocal single scan resonance scanner to average 64 scans. So this is removing uh, artifacts related to imaging at very high speeds with a resonance scanner. And these are 3D neurons. And on the super resolution, we've looked at both confocal to set conversion or restoration, as well as uh, doing expansion microscopy using an ISIM. Uh, so the input data would be ISIM data that is not expanded, and the output data of the model would be equivalent to ISIM imaged expanded sample. So points by points, point scanning confocal with a resonance scanner. That's the first example. So we wanted to increase the throughput. That was the purpose of this experiment. Could we increase the, the throughput while uh, increasing the quality of the image? improving the resolution and minimizing the artifacts. This is how we trained it. Uh, the input data looked a little bit like this. Output data looks like this, or the, the ground truth data actually looks like this. And it took about three hours to train on a eight V100s. So ground truth data in the left, uh, the raw data in the center, and the restored data on the right. And we keep track of a number of metrics, signal to noise, point, uh, peak signal to noise, normalized uh, um, root square mean error. Uh, and these give us some indication of how good the restoration is. And you can see here improvements, basically. That's, that's what this, this shows. So improvements in terms of um, uh, uh, signal to noise, improvements in terms of peak, peak signal to noise, and, in, and decrease in we can also test, and we do that uh, inside the, the, our application in Avia, and you can then get heat maps that show uh, interactively, kind of, you can see the structure similarity index, which is another metric, metric that we use to whether or not the restoration is, is good. So here, ground truth, raw, restored, and then we can compare the ground truth versus the raw, and the ground truth versus the restored. Uh, so naturally, the ground truth versus restored is, has high similarity. There's still a few areas where there is discrepancies, and so those would be the areas where the quality of the restoration isn't as good as, as others. Uh, and here, this is just a control showing ground truth versus raw is really poor quality uh, similarity. So in terms of the first experiment or first group of experiments, been able to show is that we can increase the throughput because imaging with a resonance scanner is a lot faster with a single scan is a lot faster than doing 64 scans and then averaging and then deconvolving. So we could do that uh, systematically now, which uh, means we can improve the signal to noise, improve this, the, the high throughput, improve the throughput and enhance the image quality while mitigating the, the artifacts. So that's the first little story. The second one I will talk about is uh, from the, the ARCAN paper. Uh, and here we want, wanted to characterize how a deep learning model or models can help with image restoration. We had lots of questions. These are just some of them. Uh, and I'll go through them in a kind of a sequence. First, we wanted to see, can we um, use this type of model to restore multiple organelles, restore the image of multiple organelles. And so on the bottom, you have ground truth, and the middle is restored, and the raw data is here. So we converted these images to the middle uh, using a model that was trained with ground truth and similar uh, pairs of raw. So we've done that for microtubules, mitochondria, uh, elect um, endoplasmatic reticulum, gold G apparatus, actin, and lysosomes. We're pretty convinced that this is possible for a single label. Then we wanted to know, is it possible to do this for multiple labels? So we trained a model that is, a, we call it a generic model. So it takes all four channels and is trained uh, together. And we can get this kind of restoration from this kind of image. This is the ground truth. And if we do that with a specialized model, of course, the quality is better. And you can see that 
uh, hopefully it's, the, the streaming is good enough that you can see the difference between this image and this image. Okay, both of them are better than the, the raw, but both of them are, are worse than the ground truth. And, and the specialized models are definitely better. So it's better to train a model that is specific for your organelle, for a specific organelle, than to train with four organelles and then apply to four channels. But it's still possible to get some restoration, as you can see in the middle. So to some extent, this is possible. We also wanted to know uh, how deep learning, uh, how little laser light could we use and still get good restoration. So we found that for this set of experiments with 3.4 watts per centimeter squared, we looked at microtubules at lower and lower levels of, um, of laser light. And you can see here the, the curves. <clears throat> and we compare that to point credit function deconvolved uh, and, and to for comparison. So we wanted to compare that. So at, at the low lowest level of uh, laser light, uh, you can get pretty good restoration already. So you can see here it goes all the way almost to nine, 0.9, so 90% restoration versus the ground truth. Whereas the raw data is way down here, of course, and the, the deconvolved is still lower. When it gets to about 40% laser light of the experiment that we would do, so 40% in this case is 49 watts per centimeter squared, then they are kind of similar. And when it gets to really high uh, laser light, then it's basically the same. It doesn't really matter between deconvolution, standard point spread function deconvolution and uh, restoration. We also wanted to compare to other neural networks. So we compared versus CARE, uh, ESR GAN, and SSR NET. Uh, and the results are pretty similar across the board. Perhaps in Z, uh, it's a little bit better with the RCAN than, sorry, with the, yeah, with RCAN versus, versus CARE. Uh, these two are definitely worse than, uh, than the RCAN and the CARE, but it's comparable. That's, that's what I would say at this, at this point. Um, uh, we also tested then the models that we trained with fixed samples on live samples. And we could see that the, the samples actually stayed alive for a long, long time. That's what this shows. And I'll just show you the video. So this shows uh, a long-term experiment with lysosomes and mitochondria. And we can even look at interactions. And in the, in the bioarchives paper, we have uh, a little bit of a comment about the kinds of interactions that we saw. Um, and, and, and it's really interesting that this kind of technology allows for long-term imaging uh, which enables then uh, novel experimentation and novel um, yeah, biology to be observed. There will be most likely a presentation by Gigi Chen uh, in, in a later version of this, this, uh, this event. So the final one I want to talk about is confocal to stead. Uh, so we take confocal data and stead data, train a model, and then we can take new confocal data, run it through the model and get stead-like data. So we use microtubules and we use nuclear pores. And you can see here the raw data, the stead real data, and then the restored data. So it is very similar uh, between stead and restored. Not perfect, but it's pretty similar. Of course, the confocal is way more um, blurry <laughs> in comparison. And we can systematically take data that looks like this and convert it to data that looks like this on the bottom. Um, yeah, so this is further analysis of the, the resolution. So the ground truth and the R can get to about 100 microns on the, uh, on, with the microtubules. And with the nuclear pore, we don't get, uh, we get similar um, restoration to a little bit over 100, 120 or so uh, nanometers. I want to say nanometers, not, not microns. So this shows that it is possible to go from confocal to stead-like images uh, without the need to actually image with stead. So some demonstrations now. I think I still have, uh, how long do I have, Quinn? 10 minutes? Five minutes? I'll go into it. OK, so here is Avia. That's actually that same data set, but I wanted to start with a different one. So once you apply, uh, once you have a trained model, in, in Avia, uh, here, okay. So it, here is a, a data set, it's a 3D data set. It's, uh, we can have a look in 2D. 
this is the input data. Uh, this is restored, and this is the ground truth. So you can, if you look closely on the, the ground truths, this is the ground truth data uh, of a 64 average uh, done with the resonance scanner on the Leica uh, SP8. So this is the, the input data, that's the ground truth. This is the raw data, so raw data, ground truth. And we've trained a model that then can restore this raw data into this. Uh, so there are differences between the two, but uh, in, especially in 3D, it's really obvious that you get major improvements. So this is the raw data, that's the ground truth, and this is the restored. To apply such a model, once you have trained it, it's very easy. So I just grab the model from the uh, folder, oops, a folder that I have here. You can just drag it in to the recipe console that becomes a recipe in Avia. I'm going to set a little region of interest so you see this actually running. And I'm going to use the input data. Okay, I'm going to do this little patch. Hopefully it's enough time for us to do this. And I'm going to use this as input and start. Uh, so this will, of course, require my GPU to be running. And it is. So I have an NVIDIA GPU. And it's probably using quite a bit of its uh, memory right now. So it will, up, I'll, this will, I'll just put this to the side. So it's taking this input data right here, uh, applying the pre-trained model that I dropped into, into Avia. And, and you can then run it. While this is running, just give you a, uh, a couple of bits of information in case you want to keep track. So the paper, the bioarchives paper is this one here, uh, three-dimensional residual channel tension networks, denoise and sharpen fluorescent microscopy images. You can get it from here. You can just search ARCAN, 3D ARCAN, and you'll find it. I think pretty easily. Uh, we have it on uh, on GitHub. So if you go to GitHub Avia Community 3D Arcan, you will find a uh, full description of the, the, the architecture as well as the training training examples, including samples for you to to test out uh, and all the requirements. So you can do that. This is the paper. Uh, if you want to try Avia itself, uh, you can do that through the demo page. So you can go to free trial and, and get an Avia, an Avia web demo. So that's under here. And uh, there is also a freeware called Avia Community that allows you to do quite a bit. You can check it out. It's over here. And, uh, and the Avia Community download is, is right here. So you can just come to downloads and download down there. There is no license. You just download it and, and you can use it. OK, so this is finished. Um, let's go into the 2D so you can have a look. So this is the raw data, and this is the result that we just created. So this is the raw data. That's the result. And you can also look at it in 3D. This is the, re the, the raw data. This is the result, raw and result. OK, so that's that. Uh, we also have a Python script that you can drop into Avia to qualify. So if I wanted to do that, I can just drop that in here. That converts, and this will run the SSIM, the, the structure similarity index between the, the different groups. Uh, so that's as easy as that, and you get this color heat map that you saw earlier. Um, yeah couple of other things that I wanted to show you uh, on on here. So this is the uh, similar uh, experiment, but now doing it uh, on on the stat data. So the confocal is here. This is confocal, just the nuclear pores. This is the real stat, and this is the restoration that we managed to get. So again, confocal, real stat, and the restoration you can put the three of them together uh, and you can see that the, the agreement between the two is is very good 
Um, so we can do that and then I can do the same thing for the microtubules. Focal, this is stead and this is the restoration. Uh, yeah, so you can see that these agree pretty well and we're basically going from confocal to restore, restored uh, or from confocal, this is the nuclear pore and restored. Um, last thing I'll show before I wrap up is uh, the pixel classifier. If you wanted to do any sort of segmentation on this, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, the pixel classifier is here. You can simply uh, hit select a area that you think is of interest. I'm just going to zoom in so you can see this a little bit easier. So I'm selecting this, uh, this one, and I'm painting it, and I can now apply this and it will create a segmentation for all of these. I turn this off. You can see now I have segmented all of these nuclear pores uh, here, and now I have results for all of this and the charts with all of those. So, uh, here. Actually, they're very small, all of them. So the, <laughs> the, 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 the histogram looks like that. But that's how the so Pixel S5 is a machine learning powered uh, segmentation tool. Okay, so I did some of these demonstrations. I wanted to give a big thanks to everybody that contributed to this work, uh, the denoising work and the, the 3D Arcan work specifically, Hideki, Hoyen, and John, uh, who works on the Avia Cloud side of things, uh, big thank you to them. Also, Pluto, who works on, on the image acquisition side of things. This is on the Avia team. And then our collaborators, uh, especially Harish Shirov and Gigi Chen, but also uh, Hu Zhao and Chris Combs and his, their teams for, uh, for, for their uh, tremendous contribution to, to the imaging and also the algorithm development and really every aspect of this, uh, this very exciting project. So in conclusion, the 3D Arcan offers uh, a best-in-class uh, deep learning image restoration in, in on par with some other well-known methods, and in some cases better. Deep learning for microscopy is in its infancy, so there's huge potential, but there's quite a bit of risk. Characterization is key. And that's what the 3D Arcan paper works on, is trying to characterize these, the, this new model as best as we can. Um, the, the thing, the best way to use these is by augmenting existing, existing pipelines, so embedding uh, the technology into existing pipelines. So I think Tony also mentioned that, try to make your acquisition faster uh, or go deeper. Uh, or do segmentation in, in an easier way. That's uh, that's what I think machine learning and deep learning are going to be mostly used for. And and it is very important to to de deploy things in a way that can be easily reproducible. That's why we have everything on GitHub, so you can uh, go there, get it, and apply it yourself. You can also, of course, test it out with with Avia. So the Avia infrastructure looks like this. We have Avia Web, Avia Cloud, and Avia itself. Parts of it of it look, run on the cloud side. It is possible to run everything locally as well. And there is this freeware that you can test out. Uh, so to, to do what I showed today, you will need Avia or Avia Web. And uh, that's Avia Web. And in Avia, you can do both deep learning and machine learning. And for machine learning, we do both pixel classification and object classification already for some years. Uh, and on the deep learning side, we have restoration, super resolution, segmentation, and also virtual staining, uh, which I didn't mention here, but we also do that. Uh, so going from bright field images to uh, recent like images. And we've been developing very, very quickly. So I encourage you to test out what, what we have developed over the last uh, four years, only four years since we've launched Avia. Uh, it comes as a result of a lot of R&D some of the critical projects, like the project we have with Hari, is, is one of them. Uh, but we have several other ongoing 
uh, heavy duty research projects that then lead to uh, real features that we bring into Avia. And of course, we listen to everybody that is using Avia and try to bring as many of the features that people ask as possible. So, you know, from super large rendering of large of, di of data sets to electromicroscopy segmentation, all the way through cellular analysis is what we do. So thank you for your attention. Uh, I hope that was a, a useful introduction uh, to this series and give it back to you, Quinn. Thank you for everybody's attention. And I can also take a question or two uh, now.